This morning our scripture reading is taken from the Old Testament. We'll turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 15. (coughs) Exodus 15, Israel was in bondage in Egypt, and when we come to chapter 12, We have the giving of the ordinance of Passover, Exodus 13, the Israelites now will go out of Egypt, chapter 14, Pharaoh pursues after them, God leads them through the Red Sea safely to the other side. Now chapter 15, they are safe on the other side and we have the song of Moses and the children of Israel. We will pick up the reading toward the end of that song with verse 18 and then read through chapter 16, verse 3. So Exodus 15, verse 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them, but the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree which, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put, None of, the, none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. And they took their journey from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For he had brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Thus far we read the divinely inspired sacred scripture. I'll read the text for the sermon this morning, and it's Exodus 15, verse 27. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, after Israel came out of Egypt through the Red Sea, they would travel through the wilderness for forty long years. And during those forty years, was there any place to which they ever went that was more delightful? than Elam. Maybe you've never heard of Elam. Maybe you have forgotten Elam. 
Elam is only mentioned two times in the Bible. First, right here in Exodus 15, verse 27. And then one more time in Numbers 33, verse 9, where Moses is later recounting the journeys of Israel. Elam. Whether we may have forgotten it or not, you can be sure that there was not one single Israelite who went to Elam and forgot Elam. It was so delightful. It was a beautiful, charming desert oasis that consisted of 12 wells of water and three score and 10, that is 70 palm trees. So now imagine a vast, parched desert as far as you can see, in every direction, wilderness. And now don't think of a nice, soft floor of beach sand, not that that kind of desert, through which you could run your fingers through the soft sand, but think of a rugged, gray floor, little rocks and pebbles, occasionally big, jagged boulders, some colorless shrubs dotting the landscape, mountains rising off in the distance, an occasional lizard or a buzzard scurrying across the floor, and then all of this wilderness under the intense heat, the rays of the sun, no life, no water, nothing green, wilderness. And now picture some two million people, some two million people, elderly saints, Younger ones, boys and girls, little infants being carried in arms, herds, flocks, all these people, all these animals going step by step by step through this barren wilderness. Just over three days earlier, these people had come out of Egypt through the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And after a three days journey, all their food and water supplies had been depleted. You can imagine the great excitement that they had when God brought them to Mara and how the ones up in the front were probably yelling with excitement to those behind them, there's water here, come quickly, we found water, only then to be severely disappointed when they tasted the water and it was bitter and it made their thirst only worse at least until God had Moses put a tree into the waters and made the water sweet. But then you can imagine the great excitement that they had when God brought them to this charming oasis of Elam. Can it really be? Right out here in the wilderness, rest and refreshment and life, 12 wells of water, When you hear of these wells, don't think of a deep hole with a long, narrow shaft into the ground. Numbers 33, verse 9, the parallel passage calls these fountains. These were bubbling, spring-fed pools of water, and they were all interconnected. And one Bible scholar, historian, familiar with the wilderness suggests that it may have been possible that these 12 interconnected pools stretched out for up to a distance of one mile in the wilderness. And you can picture the rich, lush, green vegetation all around the rim. And then there were these palms, 70 majestic (coughs) palm trees rising high into the sky and shouting, to any at a great distance, there is life here. There's water here. So you can imagine the great excitement of Israel when they come to this oasis at Elam. And they would camp there for nearly a month. We know that they left Egypt on the 15th day of the first month. And we know from the beginning of chapter 16 that they left Elam on the 15th day of the second month. Egypt to the end of Elam, about a month. But it took three or so days to get to Elam. So they were at Elam for three or so days shy of a month. Just about a full month at this beautiful oasis. You can imagine how hard it must have been for everybody to pack up 
everything and keep moving through the waste howling wilderness. Was there any place anywhere in the wilderness as delightful as Elam? We cannot locate Elam today. We don't know where it is. Bible scholars, historians, geologists, they disagree which of the oasis in, uh, in the Sinai Peninsula would have been Elam, we don't know. But the name Elam does continue in history. Often, Christian institutions of mercy take as their name Elam. Earlier this summer, I was reading a, a little book produced by a man in the Protestant Reformed churches who was writing on the history of his family, going back to the Netherlands, back to the late 1500s. And in that book, he was recounting how one of his female ancestors in the Netherlands in the late 1800s was a supporter of Elam in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And Elam there was a Christian institution of mercy to provide spiritual and material relief to Jewish refugees from Russia. This is a nice oasis for them. We are going to call it Elam. But not only does the name live on today in some places, in institutions of mercy, every child of God has an Elam. Life is hard in the spiritual wilderness of suffering and sin and death, but you know this. Life is not all misery. God always brings us to an Elam so that we can camp along the refreshing waters. The gospel we hear every Sunday in God's house, and when we have the privilege to celebrate the sacraments, we are brought to Elam. And so this morning, with the proclamation of the gospel, God will cause us by the Spirit to lie down in green pastures. He will lead us beside still waters. He will restore our souls. Let's consider the delight of Elam. Then, going back to Old Testament Israel, then, now, us today, now, and later for all God's people. Elam was delightful then for Israel for four reasons. First, the delight of Elam was its rest. And now we look at the main verb of the text. And they came to Elam where were 12 wells of water and three score and 10 palm trees and they encamped there by the waters. They camped there. They didn't come to Elam, stop, look, admire, keep going. They didn't come to Elam, stop, hour or two or three or however long it takes for everyone quickly to dip their feet into the water, lap a little bit of the water, get something to drink, and everybody it's time to keep moving. No, they camped there and rested for nearly a month. This was their first rest since coming out of Egypt through the Red Sea. They had been journeying for three plus days through the wilderness. After Elam, there will be very few places of rest. Elam was rest. So that God is not always proving Israel with hard, hard trials. And God is not always teaching Israel to war by sending enemies to attack them. Sometimes God says to Israel, it's time for you, dear people, to rest. Why don't you camp here along the waters of Elam? And so quietly with the shade and the waters, the Israelites rested. Second, the delight of Elam was its water, water of life. Now we focus on the last word of the text. And they came to Elam where were 12 wells of water and three score and 10 palm trees and they encamped there. Where? And they encamped there by 
the waters. Yes, there were 70 palm trees, and the palm trees were majestic and wonderful. We don't know for sure the significance of the 70. At the very least, it indicates a goodly number of palm trees so that there wasn't one or two or a little grove of four or five, but a thick grove of 70 palms. Nice shade there. But they needed more than the shade of the palm trees, and there wasn't nearly enough shade for everyone, even if there were 700,000 palms so that all the Israelites could be under the palm trees, that still will not give them life. They need something more than shade. And so the text doesn't say that they encamped by the palms. That's not the main thing. They encamped there by that which is invigorating and enlivening and refreshing what the palm trees need to live what all the green vegetation needs to live, what all the animals and all the people need to live. God brought them to water. Now it is striking that there was sufficient refreshment at Elam, 12 pools of water. And we know there were 12 tribes. And certainly the point being made here is that there is a pool for every tribe. And that means there's no fighting. There's no squabbling. Do you know what all men do through history? They fight. They fight over water and water rights as a very precious resource and commodity. You know what the fathers did? They had war wells. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, in the days of Father Isaac, there was a well named Esek, E-S-E-K, because the men of Isaac and the men of Gerar were, Esek means contention, were constantly fighting over the well. And now you take some two million Israelites and bring them to an oasis and constant no fighting. Every tribe gets a spring-fed pool of water. Sweet refreshment. These weren't stagnant waters. These were pools of refreshing water for everyone. It was so delightful to come to Elam, not only to rest, but to drink the water. The water of life. Third, the delight of Elam was its all-around pleasant or sweet experience. Now we focus on the connection between the text and its preceding context. The narrative here is very definitely drawing out a contrast. So when we read verses 23 through 26, it's all about Mara, and they came to Mara, and probably all of us could summarize Mara, we know it, with one word, bitter. And then we come to the text, verse 27, and the coordinating conjunction, and they came to Elam. And in contrast to Mara, bitter, Elam was sweet and pleasant to the experience. The Israelites would not have appreciated that sweetness of Elam had God, God not first brought them to Mara. In fact, having been taken directly to Elam, they would have taken for granted the pleasantness of Elam. So God first brings them to Mara. He makes them taste the bitterness of the waters. And then God brings them to Elam. And when they get down to the water and they taste it, it is so sweet and pleasant to them. You can imagine the shouts of joy and gratitude being lifted up to God. Come, the waters are sweet and refreshing to the first ones down to the water, shouting back to the younger siblings and the rest in the tribe. You've got to feel it and taste it. It's so good to be here. Remember Mara? This is so much better. Elam. I can only imagine if there were a man up high 
on some mountain off to the distance a little bit, some ridge looking down over the whole of the wilderness and the Elam oasis with some two million people camped down there, he could probably hear shouts of joy and gratitude being lifted up to God. It's so pleasant to be here. Elam, the delight of Elam. And then fourth and finally, Elam was so delightful because it was a token, a token of God's grace <clears throat> and faithfulness. Oh, he's such a gracious God. So gracious to these people. They had just come through the Red Sea out into the wilderness and they're already manifesting that rebellious and complaining spirit that will characterize them for 40 years. It's really striking. If we back up to chapter 14, verses 11 and 12, they're still on the dangerous side of the Red Sea in Egypt, and Pharaoh's coming hard after them. Exodus 14, 11 and 12, And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us? to carry us forth out of Egypt. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They're chiding with Moses. God leads them through the Red Sea. He brings them to Marah, and what happened? Chapter 15, verse 24. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? God brings them to Elam. As soon as they leave Elam, what do we read? Chapter 16, verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So you see where Elam is contextually? Before it, chiding and murmuring. After it, chiding and murmuring. And why does God not come and scorch them, burn them, all of them, head for head, these rebels who despise his goodness because our God is so gracious. In the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, gracious to these people that instead of scorching them, he says, in my grace, I'll bring you to Elam so you can taste the token of my loving kindness for you. He's such a gracious God and a faithful God. Remember, God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A covenant with these people. He promised to be their God. And now to lead them all the way through this waste howling wilderness into the promised land of Canaan. And God will show his faithfulness when there's no water, no life anywhere. Not Moses. Moses can't plant palms. Moses can't dig wells. Moses can't make water bubble forth. Not Moses. God brings them to the oasis that he made in faithfulness to his word of promise. I'll take care of you as I bring you to the promised land. Elam was so delightful. Rest, water, the overall experience of pleasantness, and it was a token of his grace and faithfulness to Israel then. Elam is delightful to us now, today. That literal desert oasis, Elam, pictured the delightfulness of Christ in God's covenant as we live in the spiritual wilderness of this world of sin and death. The most important, the most prominent feature of Elam was its water. There's no water in the wilderness. There was water at Elam. And the New Testament makes very, very clear that our well of water, our fountain, is 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And all you have to do in the Old Testament is go to that one passage in John chapter 4 where a Samaritan woman was literally standing right next to one of the wells of old father Jacob and Jesus came to her and said, verses 13 and 14, whosoever shall drink of this water, you have your bucket, you let it down and you draw up the water and take a drink. And whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So Elam is a picture of all of the delights that we have in Jesus all around us in the heat and the toil and the sin and the consequences and the death of wilderness life, God gives to us a beautiful, charming desert oasis called Elam. All the delights we have in Christ. What are they? Let's retrace our steps. The same four. Number one, in Jesus Christ, we have delightful rest. You know what's worse than walking through a wilderness for 40 years going step by step? Step by step through a waste howling wilderness? You know what's worse than that? Just one night. of tossing and turning and even sweating in your bed and you can't sleep because you know that what you did was wrong. It was sin against God and it was sin against your brother and you have a guilty conscience and you're so bothered and you don't have any rest, no rest in your body, more importantly, you don't have any rest in your soul. You're so deeply troubled. Your conscience is screaming. In Jesus Christ and in him alone, we have the beautiful rest of pardon with God as Jesus died, giving a once for all sacrifice to cover in the sight of God all of our sins, so that the penitent believer goes to God in the name of Jesus Christ and says, be merciful to me, O God. I did it. I sinned against thee. I did this evil in thy sight. Blot it out for Jesus' sake. And I'm going to my brother to fall down before him and confess what I did to him. And in that way, God gives rest, peace in Jesus Christ. He's so delightful. And in Jesus Christ, we have victory over all of our enemies that you don't have to live in terror and in fear. Not older ones among us, not little boys and girls among us. You don't have to live in fear over who or what may harm us. We belong to Jesus. And in him, there's rest, peace, and in Jesus, there's a Lord's Day once every seven days so that we can come into his house and not only worship God, but hear the holy gospel and receive it via true and living faith and have rest in our souls. You see, life isn't all hardship. It's not all toil and agony because God gives Christ. <clears throat> and Jesus Christ says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'm your Elam. Come to me by a true and living faith and I promise I will give you rest. And the weary sinner finds delightful rest in Jesus. <clears throat> Second, Jesus is so delightful to us because he is the water of life. By his Holy Spirit, that Pentecost spirit, he pours into the soul 
all that moisture of the covenant, satisfaction in God, joy in God, peace in God, consolation in God, the Spirit. He makes moist the heart of the believer so that the heart is saturated with all of the moisture of the Holy Spirit. Now, you, you hold up the heart of a believer, and then you hold up the heart of an unbeliever, and you compare, contrast the two hearts. This one's heavy, so saturated with the moisture of the Spirit of God's goodness and the soul of the unbeliever. It's so light, it's so dry, it's dead. There's no water there. But in Jesus, we have His Spirit and then that wellspring unto eternal life. And there's enough water for all of us. That we don't have to fight. Twelve wells for twelve tribes. One Christ for a universal church. So that we don't have to be wicked and proud and selfish as congregations of Jesus Christ and say, well, I don't know. I don't know that we want to do any mission work and be active in evangelism and personal witnessing that others may come to saving knowledge of Jesus and other true churches may be established throughout the world be cause what if there is not enough Christ and I don't get my fill of Christ. Do I want to share him with others? He's an infinite, divine Savior, an inexhaustible well. There's enough of him and all of the water of the Spirit for all his people in all the nations and the islands of the sea, wherever he gathers his own. So we don't have to fight over Jesus. Blessed Savior, what would we do without his invigorating Spirit? He's so delightful. Third, Jesus is so delightful because he is always sweet and pleasant to the experience. Now, we do all have our Maras. Personally, we have our own personal sins and we come to experience that sin is actually very bitter. It promises so much. It holds out such a glorious future and so much excitement. But every kind of sin is a liar. It's so deceitful. It never gives what it promises. And we taste that. You know how the wise man in the book of Proverbs used the imagery of a well and a fountain to speak of the delights of the intimacy of marriage. And he said to his boy, drink waters out of thy own cistern and running waters out of thy own well, Proverbs 5, verses 15 and following, let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. And then he goes on all throughout the early part of the book of Proverbs and even later to warn of the great consequences and miseries that will come when you go down that path that leads to the house of the strange woman whose lips are like honeycomb and you get too close to her and you're ensnared. And you don't rejoice with the wife of thy youth. The warning, it will leave a very bitter taste in your soul and there will be consequences. That's only one example though. Every kind of sin is bitter and we all know from experience the bitter taste of sin. Other people's sins, the sins they commit against us, the sins we see around us, that always leaves a bitter, bitter taste in the soul. And all of the hardships of life leaves a bitter taste in the soul. Personally, we all have Mara experiences. And we do congregationally also. It's true for every true church of Jesus Christ, if she exists in this world for a long enough period of time, she'll have her Mara 
Those times in congregational life where there's sin and there's strong disagreements in the congregation, there's some clashing, there's disruptions of peace, there's struggles, and God leads us through that, and we look back at that time in congregational life and say, oh, God, that was a Mara. It was so bitter to the soul. And that happens even denominationally. You look at the timeline of a denomination's history, you'll be able to find slices of history about which everyone will be able to say those were really hard years. We all had a Mara experience. It was so bitter to the soul. But Christ is so sweet, isn't he? He's so sweet in his gospel and sacraments, and we have him. And even in the Maras, personally, congregationally, denominationally, as we come to Jesus by faith, we have him. Even in a Mara, we have Christ, who is to be embraced by faith. But not only that, God leads us through the Mara and he always brings us to an Elam so that in your own life and in the life of your congregation and in the life of a denomination, there's times of quietness and rest and peace and refreshment in Jesus Christ. It's so sweet and we wouldn't appreciate it. We take it for granted if we had not first been through Mara, first Mara, then Elam, and maybe this past week for some of us to have a whole week at the BRF conference, it's like a, an oasis, an Elam for us. Rejuvenation and refreshment in Christ. And maybe some of you are living in the midst of Amara right now, and God brings you to Elam. Christ is so lovely. So beautiful. And that's what we want our boys and girls to say and experience. Boys and girls, we take you to church. We make sure you do your catechism. We can't believe for you. We can't open up your heart and give you saving faith. Our earnest prayer is that God will give you faith, each one of you boys and girls, so that you know from experience that what you can find in this world will never truly satisfy you, but that which truly satisfies you and makes you happy is Jesus Christ and his blessed gospel. Elam, all the delights we have in Christ. He's so sweet to the soul. And then fourth, Jesus is so delightful because he is the ultimate token of God's grace and faithfulness. God is so gracious to us. We're no different. No different than the Israelites rebelling and murmuring. So often we can be very contentious, we be very critical, have a negative spirit, looking at things negatively, murmuring, chiding with God's Moses, chiding with God's Aaron, grumbling and complaining about God's providence or other people. And what does God do? Well, we don't deserve anything. We don't deserve a glass of water. We don't deserve a well of water. We don't deserve 12 pools and 70 palms. And we certainly do not deserve the infinitely glorious, blessed Savior who came to this world to take the penalty for all of our rebellion and gratitude and murmuring and died in the bitterness of the cross for us. We don't deserve that, but our God does not reward us according to our iniquities. He graciously pardons and revives in Jesus. He's so gracious to us, and he's so faithful. He's bound himself to us with an oath. He promises he'll lead us safely all the way to glory. So you don't have to worry. You will not pine away in your sin and die. And you will not be left forsaken and abandoned in, in the Mara or the trouble of your life. God promises 
to lead us safely to glory. And even as Moses didn't provide Elam, I don't provide Jesus, you don't provide Jesus, God gives us our Elam of Jesus. Faithful, covenant-keeping God. Oh, the delights that we have in Christ. Now, you and I are very wicked fools. An Israelite was a very wicked fool. If he's moving through the wilderness with the Israelites and God leads them to Elam and he says, I'm not stopping. I don't need to stop. I'm going to keep walking. You're a fool, a very wicked fool, and we're going to find you in about six weeks because we're going to camp here for about a month and then we're going to keep walking and we're going to find you out in the wilderness, your corpse and the buzzards picking away your flesh, you're going to die. And I'm a very wicked fool, and so are you. When God provides an Elam, the gospel of Jesus Christ in the house of worship, and any one of us says, I don't need to go to church, and I don't need the gospel and the sacraments, I'm fine, I'm going to keep walking, you're going to perish in hell. We need Jesus. God be thanked for giving us Jesus and working in us the miracle of faith so that we see him and know him and come to him. And now weary traveler, burdened by all of your sins, just let your heart, let your heart settle on Christ this morning. His person, his work, all of his beauty, especially think of his cross and how he was hanging there for you. And he never had an Elam. Especially at the end, he did not get an Elam experience. Some tried to offer it to him. We have it for you. We've taken our vinegar mingled with myrrh. It's a sedative. It'll help take away some of the pain. And they lifted up the vinegar mingled with myrrh, those Roman soldiers. And Christ said, no, I don't want any of it. I'm here to take all of the unmitigated terrors of the wrath of God that all my people deserve. I don't even want a second of an Elam experience. I want to take the full weight of God's wrath so that there will never be even one drop of punishment for my people. He did that for you, child of God. Jesus and all the blessedness we have in him. Elam, the delights in Christ. Elam, then Elam, now, and then Elam later for the Israelites and Elam later for all God's people. Very briefly this morning, Let's look to the future later. See, the Israelites had to pack up their camp. That was not easy to do. And everybody had to get back into the wilderness and start marching. They had to leave Elam because their dwelling place was Canaan. Deuteronomy 8, verse 7. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills. They had so much to look forward to. And God would lead them through the wilderness all the way to Canaan. And they found it, a land flowing with milk and honey. It was so delightful. And yet it was not perfect. And they had to keep looking for something better than the earthly Canaan. So keep moving. And we have our house of worship here, God be praised. We have the Holy Gospel here, but then we have to leave, and tomorrow we have to go back to work. We have a nice week, some of us, at the BRF conference, a kind of oasis, and then we have to say goodbye and leave. Go back home, go back to work, and isn't that the story of our life? A little oasis here, and then back into the hardness of wilderness life and another little oasis, and then we keep 
going all the way to the final resting place, which is the new heaven and the new earth. The new creation is not Elam. The new creation is not an oasis. The new creation is not somewhere you stop and camp for a little while, and then you pack everything back up and keep marching. The new creation is the final resting place. It's Canaan, the perfect heavenly Canaan, with endless perfect satisfaction, water of life, refreshment, rest, quietness, all the delights in Jesus Christ, nothing will be able to hinder that experience. It's life with God in the heavenly Canaan forever and ever. And we as the children of God are going there. God will keep his promise. And until we get there, he's so good, he's so gracious, he's so faithful, he'll always give us an Elam just when we need it. And Elam, all the way to heaven. Who is a God like ours in Jesus Christ? Blessed be his name now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for the riches of thy goodness revealed in the scriptures, even in the early part of the scriptures, the history of the book of Exodus and the wilderness wanderings. We can relate easily. We can relate. And we thank thee for bringing out of the history of old new lessons for us today. Thanks for Christ. And may all of us here draw nigh unto thee in the name of Jesus. Bless this day of rest for his sake. Amen.